Amen. Well, hey, it's good to see you. Go ahead and have a seat. And we are continuing in our study that we've called Need to Know, which is taking the really important things that the Bible tells us about the Christian life and how to, how to do life in an effective way and looking at specific topics within that. And the one that we're looking at tonight is really an important one um, for, for all of us, really, because we're going to talk about marriage and what marriage is, but also talk about singleness and what that is. And as we look at this whole area, including, um, I hope to have time to touch on at least what happens when marriage goes bad and there's divorce, as, as there is sometimes what the Bible says about that um, and remarriage and also we'll try to cover all those topics in a really general way. I, I think that in our culture and especially in Christian culture, marriage is sometimes over-glamorized and over-mystified. Um, we, we sometimes oversell, we act like and it really hurts people who are single a lot because we act like marriage is pretty much where the way that God works. And if you're not married, there's something wrong with your life. There's something deficient. Um, and a, a part of that is to build up people in marriage. But a part of it is, is frankly, just to sell books and, and, and tapes and presentations. And so a lot of the stuff that exaggerates the role of, of marriage it also sets people up for failure because when you get married, you're expecting this amazing transformation in your life. And usually you think when you get married, we use terms like, oh, he completes me or she's my better half and things like that. We have the idea that somehow marriage magically makes us somebody that we weren't beforehand. And quite often that becomes a great disappointment as we find out that wow, I'm still the same person, except worse, and the same thing with my spouse. The sad side effects of, of this exaggeration and over-glamorizing marriage are, among other things, <clears throat> you have impossible standards to reach. Because when you're married, you, are, you have all this stuff laid on you in premarital counseling and in books that you read and tapes that you listen to. And so you, you feel like, wow, I have so much of a responsibility even to be different than I really am. It's, oh, another person's life is in my hands and all those sorts of things. And it adds undue pressure on us just to do life because you know there's no way that you can be the couple that they're talking about, that they're pretending like they are in all the seminars and everything. And so um, another, another sad side effect is the high expectations lead to a high failure rate. As soon as, you know, for a lot of people, when even in previous cultures in the past, you kind of, you got married and hey, if the man comes home every night and, and is supporting you or if the woman is there when you get home, it's like, hey, this is a successful marriage. But the more that you expect from marriage and the more that you glamorize it, the greater the sense of, a feeling that, that I don't feel fulfilled, therefore, that's your fault. Therefore, there's something wrong with our marriage where for most of history, everybody just looked at, look, let's just, let's get together, have kids, uh, you know, I'll go work, you stay at home, and they, that's what they considered a successful marriage. It wasn't about being happy and fulfilled in, in an unrealistic sense. Um, another side effect is that people who are single feel second class. They just feel like, wow, I am just, you know, I'm not entering into what God's ideal plan is for people. And we, and we treat single people as if that's a great catastrophe. Oh, that is so sad. Oh, that is, they are just, and, and again, when you use the uh, other half thing, then how else are you supposed to feel if you're single? Like, wow, there's a half of me that's missing. There's a part of my life that just isn't there, and, I, and I'm less of a person. In the Bible, that's clearly not so. There is not, if anything, the Bible tends to lean toward in the New Testament. I mean, the, 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 two, the two greatest 
examples in the scriptures, Jesus and Paul were both single. And so, and as we'll see when we get into 1 Corinthians 7, Paul has some really good reasons for being single, why he preferred that state. And so, again, I don't want to talk anybody into getting single, but at the same time, it's really wrong when we act like marriage is the ideal and singleness is something that is, well, you're just kind of damaged in your second class. Um, another thing I just wanted to mention, and I think this plays into it with all of the nonsense that you read about marriage, there are people who, and again, it's, it's because they're pitching one thing or another, but you hear these statistics about, you know, nowadays, 50% of all Christian marriages will end in divorce. It's just about like what the world is. And you hear that and you're like, you're kidding me. I mean, how often will I take a bet of saying, okay, it's a 50-50 chance, but I'm going to invest my life into this. But the thing is, that's not true at all. That statistic has never been true. It's never been that real Christians Divorce rates are anywhere close to non-Christians, number one. But secondly, the divorce rate in our country has never been, it's never even approached 50%. When at, the, at its peak in around 1980, um, the divorce rate was creeping up toward 40% among everyone. And, but at the same time, ever since 1980, the rate has been continuously going down, and there, it's less likely that people, when they get married, are going to have a divorce, but nobody tells you about that. So things like, you know, um, the rate now, by the way, is <coughs> for all marriages, including second, third marriages and everything else, is about 30% of, of marriages today are projected to end in divorce. That's a lot different than what you're usually told, even on Christian radio and television. So you're, there's a 70% chance that it's actually going to work out for you. And I think it's important for us to realize that, no, most marriages, even with non-Christians, tend to work out for the most part. 72% of those who are currently married are still married to their first spouse, which is kind of surprising because we, you know, we think, well, well, that's not, maybe we're skewed because we live in California or something, but that's just not the way it is. Um, if you look at everyone who's alive in our country, three in t only three in 10 have ever been divorced, and a lot of those are married again successfully, but divorce rate's been declining. But not only that, not only is it only like 30%, if you get married in your mid-20s, and you go to college, and it's your first marriage, and you make it through the first five years, the divorce rate is lowered to between five and 10%. So you have 90 to 95% chance of having a successful marriage if you just do some of the most basic things that we understand are an issue. Now, you can cut that in just about half by, and, and again, with the, with the surveys, they just say, they ask you, are you a Christian or are you some other religion or whatever? But if you look at Christians who get married, who, who pray and read their Bible and go to church, it's, it cuts the, between 25 and 50% beyond that. So there's like a 95% chance of a marriage being successful if they just do some of the most common sense things. Now, I'm not saying this to make divorced people feel bad because it still happens, and 5% of all Christians is still a lot of people. But I think it's important for us to be honest and not stack the deck against Christians who want to be married and make them feel like it's a crapshoot as to whether or not it's actually going to work. The truth is, most people today are, they even state that they're happily married. Like 95% of all people who are married today say that I think I married the right person and I expect this to go for the rest of my life. So it gives us, the facts give a different perspective than people who are selling stuff is my point. But let's turn to Genesis chapter two, which is where marriage first shows up with Adam and Eve, the first two people. And beginning with verse 18, it says, and the Lord God said, he had already told, he had created Adam and told him only eat of the one tree. 
And then the Lord God said, it is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper comparable to him. Out of the ground, the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every bird of the air and brought them to Adam to see what he would call them. And whatever Adam called each living creature, that was its name. So Adam gave names to all cattle, to the birds of the air, and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper comparable to him. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall on Adam, and he slept. And he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh in its place. Then the rib which the Lord God had taken from man, he made into a woman, and he brought her to the man. Now, let me just say, <clears throat> the language here in Hebrew, it doesn't necessarily mean he literally took a rib and turned it into a woman. It's He took something from the side of him, and it easily could have just been extracting his DNA and modifying it and creating somebody who would match up with him. But he brought her to the man, and verse 23, Adam said, this is now bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Woman means from man. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And they were both naked, the man and his wife, and they were not ashamed. So, you know, how many times have you heard people say, it's not good for man to be alone? It's one of the favorite things that pastors like to say at a wedding. It's like, it isn't good for man to be alone. But why isn't it good for man to be alone in the case of Adam? Well, because you cannot procreate by yourself. It, again, when you read this whole context, you realize as he brought the animals and named them and there wasn't someone there who was comparable to him, it was not, oh, you need another half to complete you as a person. Oh, if you're by yourself, you would just be miserable and weird and, and, not, and you'll end up in bars all the time. No, see, all he's saying is it's not good for, for this man to be alone because he can't procreate by himself and we need to populate the earth. So I, I think it's important for us not to believe that, oh, it's not good for a man to be alone. It's not good for a woman to be alone. Therefore, you just need to find somebody who will have you and get married because you're better off with somebody else than you are being alone. Hey, for, I, I don't think that populating the earth is a huge problem we have nowadays. And so... I, I think we need to get over this notion that we're all looking for somebody to complete us. You know, that's, it's taking a scripture totally out of context in order to, in order to um, wield that. It sells, it makes good sermon material, it makes great poetic license and when you're doing a wedding, but actually it's totally not what Genesis is saying here. However... We also see in here some of the benefits of marriage. Marriage was good for them, and here are some of the reasons why. And for one thing, they, they had the ability to procreate. That is, that is a positive thing. That is a good thing to be able to do, and so that's something that they certainly appreciated. Um, also, you see that they had a great fellowship together. They had this connection. She's bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. So, you know, that does imply that, wow, there is this connection that happens between them. So when somebody marries, that's a good, that's a good part of it. That's a good element of it. Um, you also see the, so a man should leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife and the two become one flesh. Um, Obviously, neither one of them had a mother or father to leave, so this is something that Moses supplied later to say, give it some perspective. But there is something positive about having something that forces you out of your, out of your parents' house and out of being dependent on them and to be able to go form your own life. Now, there are all sorts of other ways to leave you know, at, at your father and mother, but in, in the case of marriage, Sometimes that's a good thing because of the fact that you're going, okay, now it's time for me to grow up. But you have to grow up one way or another. Marriage isn't necessary for that to happen, but that's one of the benefits of marriage. And you know, also, you see this deep fellowship. There's somebody to be naked and unashamed with. Our, you know, our natural tendency 
certainly is to be embarrassed about who we are, to be ashamed of, of who we really are at our most, most stripped down level. And you know, for them, and of course this was damaged by the fall in Genesis 3, but having a kind of relationship where you feel safe to totally be yourself and not be ashamed, I mean, that was a huge benefit to them and really to anyone, if you have a marriage that's healthy, to have somebody that you don't have to be ashamed with, somebody that you can be naked with, somebody you can be open with, those are certainly benefits. However, he says it's not good for man to be alone. Certainly, you could say that about women, but we find out in the very next chapter, sometimes you wish you were alone because not only did they have this great stuff from having each other, that's what ended up ruining all of mankind. So it's important that we not only see two people in the garden enjoying each other and having this fellowship, and that's what we can all have, because what came out of this union very quickly, we don't know how long, but it's the next chapter in the, in the Pentateuch, is that it was, it, it was Eve who enticed Adam ultimately as she obeyed the serpent and then she went to Adam and gave him the fruit. And then they kind of, Eve blamed the serpent, Adam blamed Eve. Some of the deepest, in fact, the deepest problem in all of human history happened in this idyllic marriage. So you understand, it's, there are good things about being married, but there, are some, there can be some bad things too. There can be some negative sides too, and we need to be balanced on this. Um, now, let me explain what marriage was in the Old Testament. Um, it was, oh, repeatedly throughout the Old Testament, marriage is called a covenant. A covenant simply means a contract. A covenant is where I agree to do this and you agree to do this in return. And just like in common law, where you don't really have a contract unless there's some sort of um, money exchanged or something at least of value that's contributed. Um, otherwise, it's called, in legal terms, they call it consideration. Um, that was the same thing in the, the basic language of the Old Testament in terms of we are forming a covenant, and time and time again in the Old Testament it calls marriage a marriage covenant because you're making a deal. You are saying, we're exchanging money, and they would. There was a bride money. There was dowry. This was, a, this was kind of a business deal that they would put together. Promises were made, and there were consequences of the breach of those promises. And so we need to understand it in a contractual way, or we will misunderstand a lot of the things that, that the Bible says about it. Now, we, the, the terms of the contract weren't... We have a lot of ancient marriage contracts, so we know kind of what was typical in those days in that area of the country. But in the Bible, you see over and over again some similarities. Now, remember, for us, <clears throat> like when I do an, a wedding this Saturday, and I will, you know, ask them, do you promise to love, comfort, honor, and keep each other in sickness and health, and forsaking all others to keep you only to yourself as long as you both shall live? you make certain promises. And I think people miss this. And a lot of times when people say, well, he violated his vows, we think that only means I had sex with somebody else. When the vows are much more, really, that's a small part of it. That's a part of it. But they wouldn't break up a marriage because of that. They would stone the person. It was the death penalty. But we, we make similar promises that they made. Now, a couple of passages, you can look over at Exodus 21, and it's in the law as they're kind of, you know, they're talking about the rights of people under this kind of a covenant or under this kind of a commitment. And again, I'm looking here at the vows, the terms of the contract, and it says, um, Exodus 21 verses 10 and 11. It's talking about a guy who, if he takes another wife, they allowed for polygamy, he shall not diminish her food, her clothing, and her marriage rights. Um, and if he does not do these three, then she shall go out free without paying money. In other words, 
she gets to, he doesn't get to keep the, the money that, that her family put down on, to invest. They would, they would give money, and you think, why do you do that for a wedding? Well, the reason was because some marriages didn't last even then, and so you wanted some financial incentive, and a guy realizes if you mess up, then it's going to cost you. And the same thing for a woman. You mess up, it's going to cost you. So in this case, those three things, and, and they come up a lot in the scriptures talking about marriage, food, clothing, marriage rights. Um, literally, marriage rights is, is oil. It's the, uh, so the idea is food was an assumption. And here's the way the marriage contract worked. The man agrees to bring home food. The woman agrees to prepare the food. The man agrees to bring home fabric. The wife agrees to sew that fabric into clothes for her family. And then the third part of it was they both agree mutually to be involved physically, romantically. And, and it was that physical, their euphemism for it, a lot of times they would call it oil, but what they, or ointment or things like that, but it, it, that was really a term for being romantic together. So these are kind of the basic sorts of things that, that they would promise to, I'm going to do my part, you're going to do your part. That is our commitment. Now, to see the book of Hosea is really interesting for a lot of reasons, but, and we also find out, which if we get, if we get to divorce, we'll talk about this, that, that um, you know, it, Hosea is a book where God forced Hosea to marry a woman who he knew was a dirtbag, and then he ended up having to divorce her. And the argument of the book is that God is seen as being married to Israel, but he is filing for divorce. And you see this throughout the prophets. You see it in Ezekiel. You see it in Jeremiah. You see it in Zephaniah. You see it in most of the prophetic books that God is saying, here is why I am divorcing you. And he goes through a lot of these same elements that were a part of the marriage vows to make his argument that you haven't kept your end of the bargain. And so here in uh, Hosea 2, and look at verse 5. Um, He's talking to the kids about their mom. Mother has played the harlot. She who conceived them has behaved shamefully. For she said, I will go after my lovers who give me my bread and my water, my wool and my linen, my oil and my drink. See, what he's saying is to his, his, uh, you know, his wife, Gomer, which, you know, imagine that, but Shazam. But, you know, he's saying, I did my part of the vows. I gave you food. I gave you clothing. I gave you love and affection, those, those marital rights. And you are saying, Oh, no, other people have given me those. You're sharing all of that. You are violating this vow, and therefore God has him divorce his wife. Now, there are a lot of people who will say that, oh, he took her back and forgave her. But if you read the book of Hosea, he was told to bring her back into his house and support her, but that he would never be married to her again. In fact, the law specifies that over in Deuteronomy 29 that you aren't supposed to go back and remarry somebody after you've divorced them. So, but what I'm, the point I'm making is God is divorcing Israel because she didn't keep those, basically those three basic things of the vow. And, you know, when we get into Ephesians, we will see that even as God is talking about the responsibilities of husbands and wives to each other, that he brings up similar things as, as to what we would use, kind of to have and to hold. That's what, that's what a husband does. That's what he commits to, and a wife as well. But anyway, most of the marriage advice we have in the Bible is from two single guys. So, And maybe it should be that way, because, because Jesus and Paul not being married. Um, if you're married, you know you don't know anything about marriage. But if if when, when I was single, I knew everything about marriage. So, you know, I guess Jesus and Paul are pretty appropriate to, to, to look at this. But let's turn over to 1 Corinthians chapter 7. And partly why I'm turning to this passage first is, 
it not only tells us a lot about marriage um, in important ways, but he also makes a huge case for the fact that sometimes, and even for him, he's saying being single, there are a lot of reasons why that can be better than being married. Uh, you know, and so uh, as, he, as he starts the chapter out, w- without reading all these verses, he basically says that, hey, if you're married, you need to provide the, you know, well, he said, it's good for a man not to touch a woman in verse one. So, hey, if you can stay single, do it. That's what I do, and that's what I'm telling you to do, if you can do it. But, he says, nevertheless, because of sexual immorality, let each man have his own wife, let each woman have her own husband. In other words, don't get married unless you feel like you need to get married. If you think you can do okay single, go with that. But then he says, let the husband render to his wife the affection that's due her, and likewise also the wife to her husband. He goes on and says, you don't have authority over your own body. Don't deprive each other. What he's saying is basically, when you got married, part of what you promised was that physical relationship, that affection. And so he goes, if you're married... The reason that you get married is because physically you think you can't handle not being married. And so he goes, that's a good enough reason. It's better than you know to be out cruising bars and stuff and meeting up with strangers, but make sure that you're meeting your obligation that when once you get married, you promised this. You promised physical affection, and therefore he, he lets them you know, know, hey, that's something that you need to do. And, um, you know, by the way, though, a lot of people will take 1 Corinthians 7 on the side and say where he says, hey, if you are married, stay married, don't separate. If you do, try to get back together and all that. A lot of people will say from that that if you ever get divorced, then a Christian can never remarry. But that would completely, if you use this passage to do that, it would completely blow away his whole point in the beginning that there are some people who the choice is, Either I am married or I am burning with lust. And so he would never say, but once, you, once you're divorced, you can't get remarried. That would, that would contradict everything that he's saying here. But down in verse 10 and 11, he says, Now to the married I command, yet not I but the Lord, a wife is not to depart from her husband, but even if she does depart, let her remain unmarried or be reconciled to her husband, and a husband is not to divorce his wife. A basic principle that, yeah, divorce isn't good. Now, it doesn't mean that there aren't times when it's a necessary evil or it's a justification, but what he's saying is, yeah, stay together. That's the best thing for everyone is if you stay together, and a part of that is to commit yourself to doing what you promised to do. There are very few people who would ever get divorced if we only obeyed our vows, that I am going to love you and I'm going to comfort you, I'm going to honor you, I'm going to keep you or hold you tight, and forsaking everyone else, keeping myself only unto you. If you do that, if both people do that, marriage is going to be fine. But So he says, basically, yeah, it's not a good thing. But then in verses 12 through 16, and you can read it on your own, he says, however, if an unbeliever wants to leave, don't hang on to them and beg them to stay. If they won't, and the language here is, you know, if they won't consent or be pleased to dwell with you, to be at home with you. So he's basically saying, you you know, yeah, don't be the one to break this up, if at all possible. But at the same time, if they leave, let them go. So Paul is making an argument that desertion, um, and you can argue whether or not desertion would include just neglecting all of your responsibilities, as he's talking about earlier, or whether it's physically that you're leaving. I think the the idea that he's saying if an unbelieving spouse leaves, you you certainly can't take from that that, well, what if a believing spouse leaves? Well, no. If an unbelieving spouse leaving lets you, and he says don't hang on to them, the same thing would apply if a believing spouse, except he doesn't imagine that that would actually happen. But... Then, as he goes down in verses 17 through 24, the basic core of this is, and you can see it in verse 24, 
Brethren, let each one remain with God in that state in which he was called. So don't go back and try to fix whatever's happened before. If today you're divorced and remarried, or if today you're single, or if, hey, look for stability. Stay where you are at this point. And then he goes on, though, and, and in verses 25 to 40, and he gives reason why singleness can be preferred. And he, for instance, in verse 26 and 27, I, I suppose, therefore, that this is good because of the present distress, that it's good for a man to remain as he is. Are you bound to a wife? Don't seek to be loosed. Are you loose from a wife? Don't seek a wife. He's like, in the present distress, because of the environment in which we live, because of the way the world is today, he goes, man, there are some really good reasons to not stay attached. And, and he goes on to say that in verses 28 through 35, he says, marriage brings a whole slew of issues and problems into your life. And he says, somebody who, is, somebody who is married has to be concerned about their family more than they are concerned about the Lord. It draws them away from what their ministry is. And, and you can tell that Paul is just thinking, man, if I was married right now and I'm off trying to minister and I'm in jail and all these things are happening, you never know if I'm going to survive or not. That would be horrible for a family to have to endure that. Now, we, don't, we think that Paul was probably married at one time. He, ne he never says anything about it except that because he was a member of the Sanhedrin, it was usually required that you be married. So I don't know if his wife left him when he became a Christian, if she died, if they were divorced, doesn't really tell us. But he's saying, man, when you're single, you're lean and mean. All you have to think about is what, what do I want to do? What does God want me to do? But he says, when you're married, it's tangled. It's complicated. And so, again, just those are just reasons to prefer singleness in certain situations. Um, but, you know, stay where you are. Trouble comes, distractions. In verses 39 and 40, he says, for widows, if your husband dies, man, the smoothest thing for you is to stay single rather than to try to jump back into a marital connection. And it's not because, oh, when you're in heaven, you know, you'll have two husbands. It, no, it's, not, you know, the, the, you know, the uh, Sadducees kind of tried to argue that with Jesus. It's like, no, that's not the point. When we get to heaven, we're all going to be together. But the idea, what he is saying, especially in this distress, and he talks about it other places too, that, man, if you become a widow, that can be a blessing. You can be much more free to be able to serve the Lord and serve others, and you're not stuck. You're not trapped. And so, but at the same time, he says, but if you need to, you're not sinning if you remarry, but you ought to consider at least the possibility that I don't have to be remarried in order to feel like I'm a complete person or something. So Paul's perspective here in, in 1 Corinthians is... Um, you know, there are good things about marriage, but there are some things you ought to think about because there are some real advantages of, of being single. Now turn over to Ephesians 5, um, the passage where, uh, other, than, other than 1 Corinthians 7, is where he goes the most in-depth about marriage. <clears throat> Ephesians 5, beginning with verse 21, on through the end of the chapter. He says, Submitting to one another in the fear of God, that, that is in all relationships, wives submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. So <clears throat> the first thing is, he says, you need to submit to your husband as to the Lord if you're married. Now, the word there, remember he just said in the previous, the reason I started with verse 21 is because he, he initially says, you guys submit to one another. So that submission does not mean do whatever he says. Not like the old, the old marriage vows. Some of you are old enough, maybe you promised this when you got married, to love and obey. You know, now very few people would say that because the Bible doesn't really say it either. But you know, it, as long as men were writing the vows, it was smart to put it in there. I give them props for that. But, but submission doesn't mean obedience. It doesn't mean that they are more valuable than you or whatever. But... The word for submit, in the Greek, it's hupotasso. 
The word tasso is a word that means to arrange things, adjust things. And hupo means under or in orientation with. What submission is biblically is be willing to align yourself with somebody else, with other people. Don't just be stubborn and do whatever you want to do, but recognize that, hey, if I'm doing life with somebody else, I need to make adjustments. And we all have to do that in every relationship. If you, if you refuse to adjust, then not only will you not be married, you won't have friends, you won't have a job. You, we all have to learn to make adjustments. And that's really what he's saying. But he's saying, wives, submit to your husbands, make that adjustment. By the way, that term hupotasso was used with soldiers who were marching in formation. When you're, if you've ever been a part of a military or a part of a band or drill team or whatever, you, you know that in order to stay in formation, everybody's adjusting constantly. You're looking at your diagonals and your horizontals and your verticals, and so you're constantly lining each other up. That's the picture here, and it's so important in a marriage relationship that you know, it, a good recipe for destroying a marriage is one person always gets their way, and the other person just rolls over and gives up. No, everyone needs to make those adjustments, and in particular, it's harder for a wife probably to make those adjustments. And it's easier for a man in general to just let a wife push him around because like, oh, if mama ain't happy, ain't nobody happy, so fine. You're the boss and we'll do whatever you want to shut you up. But so he specifically says, wives, make sure that you are adjusting. This isn't about winning. This is about working together. And, but he says, as to the Lord... So we learn about this adjustment. Is he saying that your husband is like God and you obey him the way you obey God? Well, for one thing, you don't obey God very well. So if that's the case, we're all like, okay, fine. But as to the Lord, over in chapter 6 and verse 7, um, he, talking to slaves, he says, to serve their masters with goodwill doing service as to the Lord and not to men. In Colossians 3, 23, Paul says, whatever you do, do it from the heart, do it heartily as to the Lord and not to men. He isn't saying that a husband is like the Lord to you. He's saying, ultimately, you make the adjustments within a relationship because this is something that ultimately God is the one that you're following. Of course, you don't submit and give in to something that's just blatantly wrong or that God, you know, forbids. But at the same time, you understand in the same way that everything in your life is lived out for him, make those adjustments because you believe that really the Lord is your boss. The Lord is the one who tells you how to live. Now, you know, and he says, like, he goes on and says that, uh, you know, the husband is the head of the wife as Christ is head of the church. And Savior of the body, therefore, just as a church is subject to Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Again, that isn't saying he's in charge. In fact, all you have to do, if you want to know how a husband ought to treat his wife and how a wife should respond to that, how does Jesus head the church? Does he forbid us from doing things and then get mad at us if we don't? Does he spell everything out and say, here's how the church is supposed to operate? No, in fact, I wish he would sometimes because as we're blundering through trying to figure out, okay, God, what do you want in your church? He, he gives us this ability to make choices. He gives us the opportunity to make mistakes and learn from them. And he so often just, even if he has one ideal, he goes, but go ahead and do it your way. And that's the, that's the same kind of relationship. It's like, you know, yes, you are in this position, but the way you wield that position is by grace. Being the head of the family doesn't mean that you are any more valuable. It doesn't mean that, you know, it's, it all comes down. You're the, you're the one, you know, if two people are on a horse, somebody has to be riding in front, so you're the one with the reins. Not at all. What he's saying is you guys need to work together in the same way that I work with you, that the church is actually my body, Jesus would say, that's the way I want your relationship to work. That's what headship is. And then as we get into verse 25 and following, 
Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her. Um, Husbands are told specifically to love their wives. Wives are told specifically to submit. It obviously doesn't mean that men shouldn't submit and make adjustments any more than it means that men, you know, that women don't need to love their husbands. He's just emphasizing a couple of aspects here. And, uh, you know, Jesus is a great example of the way to treat a person that you are in union with, that you are connected to. I, <clears throat> you might have heard me tell the story before, but years ago, you know, 40 years ago or so, I, I was at Calvary Costa Mesa, and Pastor Romaine was counseling a guy up front, and this guy's crying, and he's going, my wife left me, and Romaine goes, good. The guy goes, good? Why is it good? He goes, why did she leave you? Because you were loving her like Christ loved the church. Is that what drove her out of the house? And, and I'm like, whoa, you know, I'm fresh out of all my seminary counseling classes, and I'm like, whoa, this is weird. A little later, I came by, and the guy's like going, but how do I change? Romaine goes, not how, when? When are you going to change? But, you know, the, the idea is, hey, if you sacrifice, the way you love somebody is you allow them to be who they are. You allow them to make mistakes. You, you show grace and forgiveness towards them. And your goal ultimately is to make them better. Your goal ultimately is to preserve them. And he goes on to say um, that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word, that he might present her to himself, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. So husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. So he goes, here's something you guys can understand. You really do care about yourself? Care about her in that same way. That's, that's the way that marriage has to work, that you are taking care of her, that you are understanding that how she does is an indictment or it's a credit to the way that you are as a husband. It doesn't mean that that if you're a good husband, your wife's not going to be sinful. I mean, it, you know, Hosea and Gomer are a perfect case of that. Or God in the church is a, a God in the and Israel is a good example that you can do it all right, and it still takes two people to work together. But you know what he's saying is this submission goes both ways. See, wives submit to your husbands as to the Lord, but husbands love your wives, and then he defines love as basically submission as you are doing what's best for her, you care about how, she, how she's doing in life and, and those sorts of things, and because he wants her to end up being fully developed. Ultimately, for husbands and wives, you can look at how your spouse is doing, and it gives you a little bit of a report card, too. Again, not absolutely, but there's something that, you know, Paul would say is connected to that. So, verse 28, husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself, for no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it just as the Lord does the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. So we get the idea that there's something going on here in marriage that's more than just two people getting together. That's more than just the kind of personal fulfillment that you get from it. God is actually using marriage as a picture of how he loves other people. And that's something that we have to really think about. When people see how we as married people love each other, it's giving either a good or a bad picture about here's how God is with his people. There are people who get so jaded they don't even believe that love is possible. Our job, if we are married, is to convince them that actually true love, true sacrifice, true selflessness, it's actually possible. Now, at the same time, for single people, the way they conduct their relationships, there are plenty of places that tell everyone to love with this kind of love, to be, you know, Philippians 2, esteem others higher than yourself, like what Jesus did. He gave up his own rights for our benefit, and he says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. So this is a general 
requirement for people who follow Jesus, but in this case, Paul uses it to connect with the idea of marriage, that marriage is an ideal opportunity and a great test. You know, it's easy to, to just be in submission with your friends because if, if, if you don't like it anymore, you just make other friends. But it's, it's a lot more complicated than that in a marriage. But n- notice, too, that um, he says to nourish and cherish. Um, those were, you know, to, those were connected with the kinds of of vows that were made in a marriage. He's calling them to keep their vows, to nourish, to feed, to take care of, to cherish. That word means to hold someone warmly, to be connected with someone, and to hold them in a way that they feel valued, that they, that they feel warmth. And so it's like this combination of, you know, you promise to take care of each other, and you promise to be loving in an affectionate way with each other. And he's saying, without being too graphic about it, he's saying, that's what, that's what I do with the church, and that's what I want you to do in a marriage. Now, we'll talk about divorce. Now, you might go, wait, you didn't get anything really that Jesus said about marriage. Jesus didn't really talk about marriage too much, but he does talk about divorce, so it's important to at least have a look at that. The first instance where divorce is talked about in the Bible, though, is in Deuteronomy 29, where, and you can turn over there, it's the first few verses of, it's a part of the law, and it became a real contention among people as to what are actually grounds for divorce, because the, the language that um, the Holy Spirit used as Moses wrote this are, are, are kind of ambiguous. He says, these are the words of the covenant, the contract, which the Lord commanded Moses to make with the children of Israel in the land of Moab, besides the covenant which he made with them in Horeb. Now Moses called um, all Israel and said to them, you have seen all that the Lord did before your eyes in the land of Egypt to Pharaoh and to all the, the servants and to all his land, the great trials. And he goes on, uh, you know, I've led you. And he tells everything that he had Done, but he says as he's as he's laying out the um, boy where it's on this part of the page actually uh, for some reason I was thinking it was Deuteronomy twenty nine but um, sorry boy this is this is embarrassing. Hey, Kenny, what's, what's the chapter where he talks about divorce? You, know, you can pull it up on your phone or something. <laughs> yeah, I thought it was Deuteronomy 29, the first few verses, but I was apparently wrong. <laughs> I'm like reading, expecting these words to come up, and they just didn't. Um, oh, 24. Okay. Change that on your outline, by the way. Deuteronomy 24, the first few verses. And let's just pretend like I said that right from the beginning. When a man ta- there we go. When a man takes a wife and marries her, and it happens that she finds no favor in his eyes, because he has found some uncleanness in her, and he writes her a certificate of divorce and puts it in her hand and sends her out of his house. When she has departed from his house and goes and becomes another man's wife, if the latter husband detests her and writes her a certificate of divorce, puts it in her hand and sends her out of his house, or if the latter husband dies, then the former husband who divorced her must not take her back to be his wife after she has been defiled, for that's an abomination. Uh, A part of the idea here, too, had to do with the fact that they, um, you know, that they were... um, saying, okay, look, you make this contract, and then when there's a divorce, the money is returned, everything. Now there's no other deposit or guarantee for it because she went off and probably had to give some of that to get with somebody else. He goes, no, don't go back, you know, don't, in another place it refers to it as a dog returning to its vomit. Um, but the idea here is, again, in Deuteronomy 24, 
that he finds no favor, she finds no favor in his eyes, and he's found some uncleanness in her. So, so the Jews, the rabbis, would always argue about what does it mean that he finds some uncleanness? And one interpretation was, if there's anything that she does that bothers him, then divorce her. Now this isn't saying, it's not commanding anyone to get a divorce, it's just saying, when you divorce someone, make sure that you give them a paper so that they are divorced. Now, biblically, what a divorce was for, the divorce writing was to give you permission to marry somebody else. If, if you just, you, somebody took off, they're still considered under the law like your property in a way, which is horrible by today's understanding of it, but that's kind of the way they looked at it a little bit. But again, the idea is there's something. Now, people have argued, commentaries have been written about what did it mean, some uncleanness? And in Jesus' day, they still had two schools of thought on it. One was that that means that, and the real strict one was, if he finds out that she had been with somebody else, that that would be the uncleanness. The other one was what was called an any cause divorce. And in an any cause divorce, it's like any reason at all. It's kind of like now we have no fault divorce. You don't even have to give a reason for getting divorced today. You just, I don't want to be with them, and that's it. Well, that was the more liberal one, the any cause one. So by the way, l- later when they came to Jesus and said, is it permissible for somebody to get a divorce for any cause? They're saying, are you going to go with that interpretation you know, of divorce, or would you go with the more strict one? Now, turn over to Matthew chapter 5. And this is where Jesus, in the Sermon on the Mount, begins to talk about divorce. Let's see what he has to say about it. In verse 31, and what he's doing is he's contrasting strict legal understanding of how, what your standard should be, and he's laying down a much stricter standard. Furthermore, it has been said, whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. And as far as it goes, that was true. That's what it said. If you're going to divorce your wife, make sure that you give her the paperwork. But he said, I say to you that whoever divorces his wife for any reason, except for, um, and and the the word there is pornia, um, fornication. It's a broad term that could, that most of the time in the scriptures, it actually refers to some sort of spiritual violation, but it refers to any kind of um, you know, sexual violation as well. It's what, where we get our word pornography. Um, but if you do that for any reason other than that, you cause her to commit adultery. And whoever marries a woman who is divorced commits adultery. Now, a lot of people take the scripture to say the only legitimate grounds for divorce is if your spouse cheats on you. But that's certainly not what he is really saying here. He didn't use the word for adultery. It's interesting. Adultery is all through the passage. He even says, you make your wife commit adultery if you divorce her for any reason. And and so, but at the same time, it's like, no, the the grounds isn't adultery, it's pornaya. See, he had just said a few verses before this that if a man looks after a woman and lusts after her, then he has committed adultery in his heart. So if you really want to get all legalistic about this passage in Matthew, then you would say any woman would have grounds for divorce because any man at one time or another looks at somebody else lustfully and therefore, boom, you're out. But it's not what he's saying. And especially you understand there's something more to it because how can me divorcing my wife make her an adulterer? So he's clearly using the term in a different way than that technically it is adultery. And people take this and twist it and they say, if you are divorced and you marry somebody else, you are committing adultery. Now he does go on to say, hey, you're making you know, her next spouse commit adultery and everything else, but he's, uh, the best understanding of it isn't that they are, even if they aren't committing any kind of sexual act that somehow they're automatically an adulterer, But the idea is you put them in a situation where they are more vulnerable to that. Not only that, and we use the English word adulterate 
It means damaged. And so, you know, what he's saying partly is, hey, you cause damage to more than just yourself. You are damaging other people. You are damaging your family, families of others, and so on. But, you know, so it's like, no, he's, he's kind of down on this. Now, turn over to Matthew 19 really quickly, and Jesus gives what would seem to be an even harsher statement on, on divorce. Um, Matthew 19, beginning with verse 3. Um, they, the Pharisees came to him, testing him. So they're setting him up and said, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any reason? And again, they're saying, is it this any reason clause? Is that the way that you're going with? And he answered and said to them, have you not read that he who made them at the beginning made them male and female? And said, for this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So then they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let not man separate. And they said, well, then how come Moses gave a command to give a certificate of divorce and put her away, divorce her? And he said to them, Moses, because of the hardness of your hearts, permitted you to divorce your wives, but from the beginning it was not so. And I say to you, whoever divorces his wife, except for pornaya, and except for some gross violation, and marries another, commits adultery, and whoever marries her who has divorced commits adultery. And they said, well, ma'am, why would anybody ever get married if it's that strict? And he said, not everybody can accept this. And then he goes on to say, you can always be a eunuch you know, if, you're, if this is a problem for you. But again, he is treating divorce in a way that he says, on the one hand, ideally from the beginning, of course, God never wanted anyone to have a divorce. He, in Malachi, it says, God hates divorce. Now, in that case, when God says, I hate divorce, is he's talking to the men who treated their wives like dirt, and therefore they divorced their husbands. And he's like, I hate divorce, so stop doing the things that cause people to have divorces. Here, it's the same idea. It's like marriage wasn't supposed to be this way in the beginning. But when they said, why did Moses give a divorce? If you read this, sometimes you get the idea that, like, yeah, well, that's Moses. This is me. Remember, the Holy Spirit inspired Deuteronomy 24. That was something that the Holy Spirit, you know, decreed and, you know, that this is what's happening. Yeah, it's because it's not a perfect world. It's because people aren't perfect. So he isn't meaning this to be dropped on somebody's head and have them feel horrible about if their marriage has failed. He's just saying, if we're talking strictly, yeah, it'd be better off if people didn't divorce. It would also be better off if people didn't harden their hearts, if people wouldn't sin. But realistically, that's kind of not the way it was. And again, you can check, you know, um, Hosea and Ezekiel and other books in the, in the um, Old Testament and see God making his argument for why he is divorcing Israel and the reasons why. Um, also, remember, there are people who would even say that if you didn't have a, quote, biblical grounds for divorce, then God doesn't recognize that divorce. And as far as he's concerned, you're always married to that first person that you had sex with or that first person that you married in, in a less extreme uh, case. But think about John chapter 4, the woman at the well, the Samaritan woman. He said, hey, go get your husband. And, and she goes, yeah, I don't have a husband. He goes, yeah, that's true. You've been married five times and now you're living with a guy. So, yep, you don't have a husband. Now, think about that for a minute. Does Jesus recognize a divorce and a marriage that follows a divorce? Well, in her case, he recognized five of them as being legitimate, or he didn't say, yep, technically, you're still married to that first guy, and none of these others are legitimate marriages or divorces. No, he acknowledged what the system did, even in a Samaritan system. So, it's foolish to believe that, no, as far as God's concerned, you're always married to that first one. No, he would rather have you do the things that make for a blessed marriage, and that's where his heart is. But at the same time, when it falls apart, he's not, he's not like blind 
to say, okay, let's just pretend like you're still married when you aren't. If, if somebody isn't, I mean, and again, you look at his grounds for divorcing Israel, it's you aren't keeping your vows. So you're not providing, you are not loving and valuing and holding and cherishing. Hey, you are breaking those vows. Now, you don't have to divorce someone. Nobody's commanded except Hosea was. But in general, you, you know, the truth is every one of us on a daily or weekly basis, we come short of everything that we promised to do when we got married. We didn't know what we were promising even. But the ideal is, the, the idea is with God's grace, hey, we can work past that. However, it's foolish to believe that you can just continue to not be loving, comforting, honoring, and keeping, holding, and cherishing your spouse, and you just think that you have every right to just stay married to them forever. There's nothing Old or New Testament that would suggest that. If you want to stay married, treat your spouse in a way that makes them want to be with you. If you don't do that, it doesn't matter what anybody else says, all the verses in the world are not going to force somebody to just hang in there unless there are people who are guilting people by twisting scripture to make you feel like you have to be with that person no matter what. That's so foreign to the whole biblical concept of a, of a contract, of a covenant of marriage that you know, even God himself wouldn't hold to that kind of a standard. Um, and then ultimately, there are a lot of people who say that if you do get divorced, that you're never allowed to remarry. And I explained in, in 1 Corinthians 7, they kind of base it on that. They would go, if you're, if you're divorced, you need to stay single. That's ignorant. The, the, the meaning of divorce is this is a permit that allows you to go marry someone else. That's what a divorce was biblically. It's a part of the definition. So anyone who, who makes that case either doesn't even understand what the Bible means or they're just looking past it because they want to pressure people to stay married instead of getting people to work on their relationships so their marriage can, can grow and expand. But nobody should ever feel like you know, yeah, you're just stuck single the rest of your life. Again, remember in 1 Corinthians 7, he goes, if you can stay single, that's awesome. But for some people, that will, they will burn up. They will, their lust will be uncontainable. And so it's, God doesn't want anyone to be having sex outside the bounds of marriage. If someone is living, you know, with those marital benefits without having that commitment that marriage is involved, that's wrong, it's destructive, it's not healthy for anyone. It's not the unpardonable sin, you know, I don't want to beat anybody up over it, but at the same time, God's place for sex is marriage. So the idea is, hey, if, if you can't stay single and handle it, then you really should be married. It doesn't, 1 Corinthians 7 would make no sense if he says, you know, if you have to get married, but then if you get divorced, then sorry whether you have to or not. You're just stuck burning with desire. That's not what the Bible teaches at all. So, in summary, marriage is an amazing gift from God. It's a privilege to have anybody else in your life who loves you, cares about you, who mutually submits with you, who you can raise a family together. Marriage is amazing. It's a unique opportunity to demonstrate God's love. And so it's something that if someone desires to have that kind of relationship with another person to that extent, with the responsibilities and obligations that accompany it, that's great. It was right from the beginning. It happened with Adam and Eve for more reasons than just procreation. However, let's not glamorize that and just assume that, yeah, it's easy. Or let's not just act like that's God's best. Paul makes it really clear. Being single, he said, from my perspective, it's better, actually, if you can do it. You know, if you can't do it, then being married is great, too. We don't hear this very often. You know, we don't talk about this. Most single people feel like, well, they're, yeah, if you can't find anybody, then, yeah, I guess you should be single. Where the, what the scripture would indicate is more, no, be single unless something causes you to really be drawn into a relationship. You find the right person, and you're like, I can't imagine living my life without this person. Awesome. 
But then even then, if something happens, still consider uh, if, if, if you lose a spouse. Wow, maybe this is an opportunity for you to serve God in a more unique way. Or even when you get a divorce, don't rush off and, and get a rebound marriage because you know, there may be something about you that doesn't work with marriage very well, and you need to give yourself at least an opportunity. Slow down here and see, okay, what does God want for me? But we cannot glamorize marriages if it's better than singleness. I think it's, if anything, we should glamorize singleness a little bit more. At least that's what Paul does, but it was the Holy Spirit inspiring him. But we should all appreciate that marriage can be a blessing, and being single can be a blessing. Both states equally are conditions that God uses in a beautiful and a powerful way, and different roles work with different sorts of relationships. Um, I sometimes think, wow, being a pastor um, and being a husband and a dad, I can understand why Paul goes, it's actually easier for me to be single. Because it is. It's, it's hard to balance all of that out. It's hard to care for a whole lot of other people and make sure that you're not giving your family short shrift. It's something that I look back and go, man, if I had life to do over again, um, I think I still would have been a pastor, but I probably would have done it a little differently where I would have had more of my attention on my family knowing that that's important. And I, I don't think I was neglectful of them, but at the same time, it's more complicated. And so we need to see this, realize it for what it is. Marriage, if you're married, make it a blessing. Keep your promises. Love, comfort, honor, keep, cherish, hold, show affection. These are things that you do if you want to keep a marriage. At the same time, if you're single, don't just be obsessed with getting married, which really repels people anyway. But look at, okay, right now I'm single. What advantages do I have in my singleness that I can cash in on right now while I'm single? The future, hey, that's up to the Lord. He knows your heart. He knows your desires. He knows your needs. But we need to hold up both and value them both. And at the same time, we need to show grace to those for whom marriage fails. For whoever, It doesn't matter whose fault it is. Sometimes it happens. Not as much as sometimes people think once you look at the statistics. But at the same time, sometimes marriage doesn't work. Hey, marriage is like an impossible thing. We shouldn't be surprised when it goes bad. It happens plenty of times. And it's not always both people's fault, and sometimes it's nobody's fault. You know, there are, I've known people who just went through something horrible, like losing a child, and they just couldn't work through that and reestablish the kind of relationship that they had. I've known other people who lost a child, and it brought them together. But we can't judge. We can't just look at people and brand them and treat single people or divorced people as being second class, and really what God wants is for everyone to be married. Maybe your mom wants that, but that's not God. And so we need to be gracious and just go, hey, as, as Paul says in 1 Corinthians 7, stay where you are right now and consider why you are, where you are, and make the most of your condition at this point, and then see what happens in the future. Well, I got through this in only 17 minutes late, which I was afraid it would be worse than that. So there's a lot. Now, in a few weeks, by the way, just to give you an idea, I think next, next Wednesday night I'm going to be talking about the battle for the mind, depression and anxiety and some things like that. Following week, I think I'm talking, well, maybe the following week is together, but the next study that we have in Need to Know, I'm going to talk about prophecy, eschatology, future things. And then the final week of the Need to Know series, I'm going to answer questions. We're going to have questions and answers. And so keep it in mind. And if in any of these studies, some things have come up that are questions that you might have, maybe you can come that night of the question and answers and we can talk about some of these more fully. Because I, I have to admit, every one of these subjects, I'm trying to cram everything into it. The truth is, we really need to know more than I can cover in a, in a 50 minute study and that's just the way it is but hopefully you have some scriptures you can go back and read some of these and see how see what the Holy Spirit tells you concerning them let's pray Lord thank you again for your word for your love for us we thank you for the blessing that marriage is for many of us 
We thank you for the blessing that being single is for others of us. And we pray that as single people, that we would be the best single people we can be. As married people, that we will make the most of the marriages that you've given us. But help us to always remember that we are all your family, your body, and help us to not judge others, exclude others, make people feel guilty if they, you know, for reasons that often we don't even know why a relationship didn't work for them. So help us to reflect your love and your spirit in all of these matters. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.